to Axios newsletter. Since then, we've covered a lot of deals, over 10,000. M&A deals, VC deals, private equity deals, growth capital, IPOs, and more. If you work in deal making, you know it can be a lot to keep track of. That's why now we're launching Deals Tracker, a new feature exclusively for Axios Pro. Deals Tracker uses AI to read and consolidate our coverage, giving you the information you need about the deals that matter to you. Here's how it works. Every deal we've reported on has been added to a new searchable archive, and every deal we cover in the future will be added too. The Deals Tracker gives you quick access to deal history for companies and investors across a variety of industries. You can easily narrow your research, focusing on the things that you care about. The tool lets you easily see different deal types to understand who's raising money, who's buying or selling, who's merging, or big personnel moves. The search results are concise and easy to read, giving you the most important information in seconds. But if you need to dig deeper, you'll be able to download deal data or explore our in-depth reporting, giving you context to why deals happened. When you combine the utility of the deals tracker with the analysis and expertise from our industry leading journalists, Axios Pro now offers the most helpful toolkit available to the modern deal maker. All Axios Pro deal subscribers get instant access to deals tracker, Subscribe today at AxiosPro.com. The show will begin shortly. Welcome aboard. Please welcome to the stage Axios Local Columbus reporter Tyler Buchanan. Hello, hello, good afternoon. Uh, really excited to be here. My name is Tyler Buchanan, and alongside my colleague Alyssa Widman Neese, we are the co writers of the Axios Columbus newsletter. Very excited to be here at this uh, community solutions event talking about. Uh, plastics, the circular economy, and some good environmental issues. So excited about it. Um, if you're watching online this morning on uh, X, formerly known as Twitter, we ask that you use the hashtag Axios events uh, to follow along with these conversations. And if uh, you don't already subscribe, have to put in a plug, obviously, to Axios Columbus newsletter. Visit axios.com backslash local backslash Columbus. Make sure you can get smarter, faster on all the news and culture and events going on here in central Ohio. So like to introduce our first guest. He represents the 25th District in the Ohio State Senate here in Central Ohio. Welcome to the stage, Senator Bill DeMora. Hi, 
How's it going, Senator? Uh, Senator, I, I know you have um, a long history of kind of working on environmental issues. I know before you were elected to the State House, you were involved as executive director of the Ohio League of Conservation Voters, hoping you can just kind of set the scene a little bit for your own work uh, with that organization and kind of how it informed uh, your work now as a state senator. Well, I was uh, chosen as executive director back in the end of 2003, beginning of 2004, and I was there for uh, almost five straight years and, and learned that the environmental community in Ohio was not exactly the most respected down at the state house with, with lawmakers, that they didn't really have a presence both either lobbying or politically, and LCV kind of had some issues, and I kind of went in to try to make it a someone who was, had, had to be a player in, when it came to statewide politics in, in the state house, and we accomplished some of that. Um, I've always been environmentally uh, conscious. I think I was recycling before recycling was recycling. Uh, I've always, I'm the one of those guys always saved the pop tops off of cans. Um, but in the legislature, as one of the seven Democrats in the Senate, my, myself and my colleagues try to look out for the environment over the interests of people that just want to pollute it just for the sake of polluting it. I mean, fracking and state parks. And um, I just wrote a letter to the commission that was determining that just supposed to be due on Monday. And they decided not to go forward and have any fracking in state parks because of the controversy with this organization that made up all these, pe all these letters and made up people's names and sent them in. So I think they have, I think they go hand in hand. I think if you're a good public steward, uh, a good public servant, you should be a, bu a good public steward of the environment as well. So if you read any Axos, you know, newsletters or uh, stories on our website, you know, you, you'll see at the top of pretty much every single story, you know, we always talking about why it matters, getting to the heart of, of all the issues that we're writing about. And you being at the State House, obviously they're covering so many different types of issues and everybody, you know, of course has interests and stakes in all those issues. How do you try to convince, you know, either your colleagues in the state senate or other lawmakers or maybe your uh, constituents, how, how do you try to convince them that these environmental policies matter, you know, alongside those other issues? Well, I mean, it's, it's a lot to do with what happens every day in the world now. We've had the hottest year on record. We've had huge storms in the Atlantic. We had flooding all over Europe. We've had flooding in the United States. I mean, people got to start realizing that climate and climate change is the number one issue facing all of us. Um, but also my colleagues, I mean, listen, I understand that I'm one of seven and I'm probably number 33 out of 33 because I'm the most political of the Democrats. Having worked for the state Democratic Party, I still work for the state Democratic Party uh, as well. So I'm the political person. So, I mean, my job is to call them out when they do stuff like want to frack in state parks and, and, and bills that we just heard earlier this week. So my job is to kind of call them out to make the public aware of, hey, your state government is actually doing these sort of things. Because most people don't pay attention to their state government. I mean, they have everyday lives, and they have other issues to worry about. And what they do in the state legislature, if you don't live and active in downtown Columbus and in, 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 the, in the community that hangs around the state house all the time, you don't know what happens to state government until they do stuff like try to take away your woman's right to productive health and issues like that become statewide issues. But most people don't know the day-to-day -day stuff goes on there, and it's my job to try to make them aware of it by calling out the stuff going on. Gotcha. Uh, Alyssa, later on in this program, is going to be talking with uh, some folks that are working on these issues from definitely a more local lens. You know, in the local newsletter that we write, we're always kind of focusing on, on definitely what's happening on a, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood issue. You being at the State House, you know, how do you, I guess, how, how does it inform you with covering these issues from a state level? as opposed to the local level, and then, of course, you can get federally, you know, anything that the Biden administration is doing. How do you kind of cover this from a state level? I mean, I try to represent my constituents. My, I have a very diverse district. I mean, I have Clintonville, part of Clintonville. I have Upper Arlington. I have Grandview Heights. And then I have the area where we have a lot of new Americans. All the Somali, both Somali state reps are in my district. So I have a very diverse community. And, I mean, different issues affect different parts of my community. Uh, and I try to represent their interests and what's best for them in the state house. I mean, for instance, public transportation is a huge issue for a lot of my district. And Columbus being the 14th largest city in the United States and the largest city in the United States without public, without a real light rail and public transit. We have, CODA does a, tries to do a great job, but we have no light rail here. And that, that hurts us. That, that, I mean, we are a car society and that adds to, you know, greenhouse gases. And it's just trying to, trying to help my constituents, but also the state as a whole. Like I said, 
The environment is not the number one issue of the majority of the people the, that are representing Ohio in either the House or the Senate statewide. It's my job to try to make sure that they understand that these things have consequences. And the state has gone backwards since Ted Strickland was governor. We used to be in the top 10 for efficiency. Now we're in the bottom 10. We used to have more going on with our um, renewable portfolio that was up there when Ted Strickland wanted 30% by 2030. And John Casey came in and gutted all that stuff. So we are going the opposite direction here in Ohio, where all the states around us are going in the, in the, in the right direction. So I'm trying to, trying to inform my colleagues of that. Sometimes it's a losing battle, but sometimes you get a victory or two. Okay, take us through, I guess, a couple things that you guys are working on in the state house, or maybe that you've uh, sponsored and co-sponsored. And we could go um, all day, but well, right now I'm co-sponsoring the bill to end end the subsidies that Ohio ratepayers are paying coal plants, one in Indiana and one in Ohio, that are inefficient because of the whole Senate Bill Six fiasco. So I'm a co-signer of that bill. Had its first hearing yesterday in U Energy and Utilities Committee. I don't know if we'll get a second hearing because it's a Democratic bill sponsored by Democrats to of course, give back money. Um, so who knows what will happen with that. Another bill, obviously, it was involved the trying to stop this fracking in state parks. I mean, it's ridiculous now that the Senate passed a bill to say if there's natural gas under a state park, you have to frack there. You have to extract the natural gas from the state park. That's ridiculous. I mean, some of the things they want to do, uh, I mean, the fact that the siting board now has to uh, review and approve all solar, uh, all solar and wind stuff in Ohio, and that just gives the NIMBYs more of a chance to protest those. I mean, it's, it's not feasible the way we're going in Ohio uh, with what, what our current legislature is doing. And, and the governor says he's for this and for that, but like gun control and everything else, the governor says one thing and then he backs off when the, Senate, when the House and Senate leadership say, well, we're not going to do it. So how much of a challenge is that, you know, being in, in the political minority, I guess, there at the state house, you talk about still just kind of fighting your good fight, uh, I guess, how do you approach it? Well, luckily, I've never been the majority. Again, I'm here from redistricting. It's kind of a long story how I got in the Senate. Um, but I knew what I was getting into. And I worked in the Senate back in the 80s, and we were in the minority. So I knew how things worked. So that doesn't frustrate me. It just frustrates me sometimes that some of the policies they put forth, they want to concentrate on culture issues and stuff, not to help the state move forward, not only the environment, but in lots of different issues. I mean, transportation, um, housing, uh, the, 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 the budget we just passed didn't, I mean, when it took money away from food banks, when we have an overwhelming need for more food bank assistance. I mean, it's frustrating that I think common sense wise and, and people in my district say these are the issues we ought to be addressing, not worrying about taking away women's right to productive freedom, trying to pick on seven trans kids that happen to be playing sports in Ohio. I mean, seven out of tens of thousands, they have to pick on seven kids. And they concentrate on that stuff that does not, doesn't do anything to move the state forward and actually is driving young people in the state away. We've been a, uh, a lost state when it comes to college graduates. For 10 years in a row, college graduates are leaving Ohio to move other places because Ohio is moving in the backwards direction. And trying to get them to understand that, when we have a job shortage, they, wanna, they say we have a job shortage here, but they don't do anything to try to address the issue, which is young people not staying. It's, it's ridiculous. So you're talking about... Um you know, things that, that they're focusing on that, uh, you know, you, you would not, I guess, if, if you were magically, I guess, tomorrow, you're suddenly in the majority, I, I've made you Senate Majority Leader. What, what are kind of some of your wish list items on? Uh, I mean, wish list, I mean, take care of the people that need to take care of most, a tax cut for the rich. I mean, we need to give tax cuts for child credit that got eliminated for, for people that need it most. Um, the taking away of the um, extra money during COVID for food stamps. We need that. We need to get more food bank money. We need to have more affordable housing in this community. We have to have light rail and public transportation. We have to take better care of our state parks. That fly love must like me here. Um, and the environment. Uh, we, need to find, we need to find a way to keep young people in Ohio. And, and that's not by taking over the State Board of Education. That's not by making teaching both sides of the Holocaust in college campuses like they want to do. We're doing everything we can to move backwards. The Democrats, if I was in charge, we'd be doing the opposite and moving every forward and taking care of the middle class and the people that need to help most, not taking care of the, the people that make over $10 million a year that don't need our help. How, uh, your, I guess, perspective now being at the State House, you're not, uh, are you still with the League of Conservation? No, no, no. I, had, I left the League several years ago when I went back to do political consulting. What, what's, uh, what's your feeling on, I guess, some of the local or, or regional state uh, environmental groups and kind of what they're working on? Well, I mean, Franklin County, listen, I mean, you're going to hear from people later that no more 
have more depth than I do, but for, I mean, City of Columbus went from once every other week recycling to every week recycling, which I think is a huge thing. For someone, if you miss once, I mean, it gives more people incentive to recycle. Uh, Ohio State, which is in my district, they have a, they're going to a no-waste policy. I mean, every time you go to a football game, you get an email, you know, hey, let's recycle, let's compost, let's have, try to have a no-waste after a football game so that everything that's consumed goes back into either composting or recycling. So Franklin County, my district, is very progressive on these issues, and we're moving in the right direction. I can't say that about the rest of the state. So, but in my district, I mean, we are trying, I mean, the city of Columbus has done a great job, Mayor Ginther, our county commissioners have done a great job trying to be more environmentally protective and trying to protect the watershed over there in the little Derby. So if everybody was like Franklin County, the state would be much better off because we have very progressive leadership, both the city and state level. I can't say that for the, everybody else in the state. Gotcha. Um, we talk a, a, a lot at the end of uh, news stories and newsletters for Axios, uh, kind of what's next and kind of what we're watching for, things like that. What, what should uh, folks out here and uh, listening online, what, what should they be? Uh, Environmentally, this whole fracking and state parks bill is going to come up again. Um, this, I mean, again, removing Ohio taxpayers and ratepayers paying for un, unefficient, inefficient coal plants, one in Indiana. I mean, it's something like a hundred and some thousand dollars a day Ohio taxpayers are paying for a coal plant in Indiana. It's ridiculous. Um, so that's going to come up again. Um, at some point, we're going to have to address the need of, of housing um, because housing is, is the number one when it comes to getting people to stay in Ohio with, with job creation. Uh, and again, climate change. I mean, everywhere is affected by climate change. I mean, our policy is about having no rail. And so everybody that lives in the suburbs drives into downtown and drives back every day. That just... There's more cars on the road lead to more, I mean, lead to more, more, more emissions for the atmosphere. So all these issues that might be national, but they have a local component to it too. And if we can do our part, maybe we can get other people to do their part. Got another minute or two, Senator. Anything else that you kind of want to mention on the no, environmental front? No, I, I think this. I mean, Ohio. We need to take, we need to be more of a leader. We were at one time, but we've fallen behind all the states around us. We've fallen behind the state up north. I'll never say their name. We've fallen behind Pennsylvania. We've fallen behind Wisconsin. We've fallen behind Illinois. We need to get Ohio back to being a leader in efficiency, in renewables, like we were back 10, 12 years ago. We were leading the industry. All these jobs that could be created in Ohio with renewables and energy efficiency, we could power the future economy by doing these things, but we're not taking the right steps to do that right now, and we need to do that as Ohio to move forward. Uh, Senator, last uh, question in five seconds. You have a, you're going to uh, OSU Notre Dame this weekend. Score. I'm driving this off Ben tomorrow morning, of course, yes. Score predictions, Senator. Ohio State's going to win by two touchdowns. You heard it here. Senator Bill DeMora, Thank thanks you, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. a warm welcome to our View from the Top moderator, Nicholas Johnston. Uh, I'm Nicholas Johnston. I'm the publisher of Axios, and nothing we do at Axios is possible without uh, our partners. The investments we make in local journalism, events like this, the delicious snacks are here, all thanks to our partners. So a huge, huge thanks to the American Chemistry Council for making today possible. And I have double bonus thanks. 
uh, for the council because they're helping us invest in journalists, not just here in Ohio, uh, but in Louisiana and Texas. And so a huge thanks to them for making this and many other things that we're able to do possible. And I want to welcome to the stage for a view from the top segment now, uh, the president of America's Plastic Makers, Ross Eisenberg, and the senior director for plastic sustainability at the American Chemistry Council, Craig Cookson. Ross and uh, Craig, come on up. Welcome to Axios. Welcome. Good to see you. So let's start uh, big picture. Uh, literally, the audience is sitting on plastic chairs. I wrote my notes today with a plastic pen. My mic is clipped uh, with a plastic clip. So the question, it feels like, for something that's so prevalent uh, in the economy now, and maybe, Russ, we'll start with you, uh, it's almost a question, what are we doing when we're done with it? Like, what is the solution then to plastic waste because we're using it so much? So it, thanks for having us here today, and, um, and we're, we're really excited to be able to partner with, with Axios um, on these, these events. Um, I'm excited about this one in particular because of the question you just asked, right? Um, you know, plastic, we do have a plastic waste challenge because of the ubiquity of the product, but, um, but it's a challenge that I'm excited about because it's one that is, in, you know, very solvable. And, and it's, it's something that we as, as the plastics industry are committed to doing a whole lot to solve. So um, how do you get there, right? Um, because as you said, it is in so many of the things that we, that we touch and we, we benefit from. Um, it requires uh, really a, a multi-pronged approach. Uh, you have to do, you know, it, it, there's not one solution. You have to deal with collection. You have to deal with sortation. You have to deal with uh, consumer education, access to recycling, um, actually getting people to uh, be able to, 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 to put their uh, plastic waste where, where it will be recycled. And then you have to work on the recycling infrastructure on the back end. Um, we, the, uh, the American Chemistry Council, American Plastics Makers, are uh, actively working on all of those things. And it requires collaboration ac across the value chain with, with not just the manufacturers of the plastic itself and the recyclers, but also the brands that, are de that, that, that actually will, are the ones that are, are, are the consumer-facing folks. Um, it requires um, a lot of policy. Um, and that's where we are playing the hardest right now, which is you know, actively supporting things like a global treaty on plastic uh, uh, pollution, um, working with the federal government to try to get things uh, uh, signed into law that will increase the amount of recycled content that, that we're using, um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll, we'll deal with some of the, the collection issues and the sortation issues. Um, and at the state level, also working on a, a wide range of things to uh, increase the availability of recycling technology uh, and, um, and also to deal with the end of life of plastic. So it's, it's an all fronts battle, but it's one that, like I said, we're excited about because we think we can make a big difference. And here. we heard pieces of that from Senator Moore just now, is like the way Ohio State approaches a no waste. Um, like that's almost on consumer education, the way Columbus is now doing more opportunities for that. And so like we're in Ohio, not by accident. You know, right. why is this conversation taking place here? So Ohio is, first of all, it's about jobs, right? So Ohio is the number one uh, plastics employment state in the country. Um, it's also a state where things, important things are happening, right? Um, this is a place where, in 2019, Ohio passed laws to improve the uh, recycling infrastructure, to, uh, to enable new technologies to come online. Uh, Craig was, was integral in that uh, and just updated that, uh, I want to say, last year. Um, and it's worked. We are seeing new technologies come online. There are three facilities that are either um, uh, operating or under construction uh, or announced that are going to advance this new recycling technology. So, um, and, and this is a place where it is all happening. Look, Wendy's is, is headquartered in Dublin, just 20, 20 minutes up the road. They are, uh, they are actively using some of this new advanced recycling technology for their cups. And so the, the cup that you're drinking out at Wendy's, uh, out of at Wendy's, could, you know, will have, will have content in it that it was made through advanced recycling. Well, let's get in a little bit. Like, let's give Craig a chance now to jump in here. Like, you're the recycling expert. Like, can you dig us more into sort of the specifics of how this works? I mean, things like that the EPA is already committed to $100 million to supporting and that, like, what, what is the technological solution then to recycle our way possibly out of this problem? Yeah, so first of all, <clears throat> recycling is one part of the solution. I mean, industry is doing a ton. They're making plastics that are, uh, you know, can do more with less, right? Using less material, making plastics from... Uh, renewable resources. Um, <clears throat> but here in Ohio, there is a huge opportunity, right, to, to recycle. So if you took just 50% of the plastics that are going to landfill right now in Ohio, instead built businesses through advanced recycling, mechanical recycling here in Ohio, you could have $420 million in economic output every year, additional economic output. Um, as well as if you, if, if you took that, those 50% of plastics, you could divert or essentially make plastics from recycled materials instead of 500,000 tons of plastics coming, coming from virgin 
resources like oil and natural gas. So good for the environment as well. So what are the steps that are required to get there? Then. The steps are, I mean, I, I think Ohio's done a great job, right, with, as Ross said, in 2019 passed sort of the first advanced recycling legislation, um, passed a updated version earlier this year, making sure that advanced recycling counts for recycling, that it counts for recycled content, so being supportive of business. But as Ross mentioned, there's many parts of it. You have to have good collection, so education is a big part of that, making sure people know what to put in the bin. You're going to be talking to Ms. Shockey in a second and, and her Sustainable Columbus Action Plan. And that puts a really important emphasis on education and communication so people know how to recycle. Right. Do you feel like you have the right partners here, I think? Like that there's a momentum at a, at a, at a state level. And I'll, either you jump in on that as far as like it's not just industry doing it. It's not just consumers doing that, but kind of an all of the above, a whole approach. Definitely, yeah. I mean, the policymakers have been great up just down the street at the state house. As well. Right. So, like, uh, Ross, I want to come back to you. There is, and we can jump on something right out of the rip from the headlines of this morning. There's like a always in the news a sense of like, well, you know, there's got to be alternatives, right? right? Like, you don't need plastic. Maybe glass would be more efficient. Uh, Mike Bloomberg just announced $500 million today to say, well, we'll just not use plastics at all. Uh, yes. So, um, very I timely. Look, it, it's Climate Week, right? Um, so, so, climate is, I think, one of the you know, unspoken or, or spoken drivers of, of, of this debate around what to do about plastic production and plastic waste. Um, one of the things that we continue to forget is that we use so much plastic because it is, at its heart, generally the most sustainable, sustainable solution for the purpose that it's being used for. Half of the volume, volume of your car is plastic, but only 10% of the weight of your car. And that's regardless if it's a, it's, it's a gas car or, or an electric vehicle, which has the heavy battery and powertrain in it. Um, you need to lightweight that vehicle, and that's generally coming from the plastic. Um, you know, if you, you know, spray foam insulation, which is made from plastic, if you put that in everybody's home, that's the equivalent of taking about 40 million cars off the road every year. So in, in the applications that it's in, it's a sustainable solution. Um, I, had a, I was at a thing a couple days ago, and a manufacturer was looking at switching the bags that they, they put their product from, uh, in from plastic to paper. And they said, well, the, here's the rub. That actually raises our carbon footprint if we do it that way. So for certain, you know, and so, so I think the answer to the question, either to, you know, the glass issue or to the Bloomberg issue, which I do want to talk about in a second, is, you know, we're not, there's a, there's a place for every material here, um, but one of the things we've been calling for is data to actually inform that, right? Let's do this, let's make sure that we have the, the data. We want actually the federal government to do an ongoing life cycle assessment of all the materials for packaging so that we know what the right ones are. There's going to be some, some places where glass is the right choice, there's going to be some where aluminum is the right choice, and there's probably going to be a lot where plastic is the right I mean, what you're saying is not an either-or thing. It's definitely not an either-or thing. And look, on, on Michael Bloomberg, I, you know, we think this is a losing bet that he's made. He's trying to stop, uh, frankly, the, you know, all of the sustainable solutions and frankly, recycling. He's actually targeting, you know, blocking recycling here, which is a bit of a head scratcher. Um, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's very, very puzzling given that, that he's actually, you know, kind of cutting off the nose to spite your face. You're, you're stopping the things that are actually going to reduce climate. And I mean, look, today is not only the day that he announced that, it actually happens to be the one year anniversary of the um, signing, the Senate ratification of the Kigali Amendment to phase down hydrofluorocarbons, the refrigerants. We pushed for that. I lobbied for that personally to get that done. Uh, and, um, and that is going to avo uh, avo avoid about half a degree Celsius of global warming as it's put into place. So while he was trying to stop recycling and stopping plastics, we were actually getting things done on the ground. I'll let you decide who's uh, spending their money more wisely. All right. Uh, so before we get the hook here, Axios Tradition, end on one fun thing. I won't make you pick football scores unless you want to, <laughs> but let's keep it more on topic. Uh, Bring us into the real world, maybe. So, like, 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 you mentioned a little bit about how Wendy's is using this thing. Like, what's the coolest, neatest, like, kind of, oh wow, kind of moment, or that you've had in sort of understanding, like, what that that, that full circular supply chain looked like? A couple things. I think number one is is advanced recycling is using kind of basic chemistry. What my kids are learning in high school right now. Um, it's really just rearranging the carbon to hydrogen molecules and breaking these plastics back down in their raw materials and rebuilding them into new plastics again. So just that it's actually kind of simple at its core. Uh, the challenge is, is, you know, trying to recycle a heterogeneous mix of different, you know, snack bags and, and right. pouches and tubes and things like that. And then what can you do cool with that? So I, I think what's cool is I understand the Ohio State University has, Yes, okay, bring it home. Perfect. Okay, <laughs> have, have, has just put in a new field turf, right? And, and those things don't last forever. So before, you would take that old field turf that's, you know, they're all plastic, and you'd throw it away. It might sit in a landfill for forever. 
Now you can take that through advanced recycling, turn it back into its basic you know, raw materials again, and then rebuild it into new plastics again. So I think that's pretty cool. So the right. Ohio well, State it wouldn't University. be an event in Columbus, Ohio if we didn't end on a note. I think right. like Ohio hey, State. Do you have a better one? No, I'm, I'm <laughs> sticking with, uh, with my expert here. <laughs> Oh, perfect. Uh, Craig and Russ, thank you so much for making this happen. Thanks to the American Chemistry Council. Thank you all for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome to the stage, Axios Local Columbus reporter, Alyssa widman niece Good afternoon, everyone. Let's continue now with our next guest from the city of Columbus. I'm very excited to welcome to the stage Sustainable Columbus's Deputy Director, Elena Shockey. Well, I was hoping we could start by having you give us just a quick overview of what exactly Sustainable Columbus is. Yeah, thank you, Alyssa. I'm very happy to do that. Sustainable Columbus is uh, the City of Columbus's sustainability office. Um, we were formed uh, back in 2018, and we've got a mission um, to work to reduce the climate impact that the City of Columbus and our community has, um, working to meet a bold goal um, as you heard from Senator DeMora, to uh, achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 mm -hmm. um, and uh, reduce greenhouse gas emissions significantly by 2030, all um, with the goal of centering our work in uh, racial equity, uh, climate justice, um, and social justice. Yeah, well, those are some great things I think we're going to talk about here. Um, I thought we could start by talking about the Climate Action Plan. Um, as you mentioned, there's the goal of being uh, carbon neutral by 2050 and taking some steps to get there. Um, one thing that I wanted you to talk about was the fact that here in the next couple of years, the plan's going to be expanding to include the whole Central Ohio region, which sounds like a pretty big undertaking. And I'm wondering what the benefits are to that approach and whether there are some other examples maybe elsewhere in the country where this sort of thing has happened that you could look to. Yeah, that's a great question. And this is, I think, one of the exciting moments for us uh, with the IRA and the BIL coming out of the federal government, it's really changed the opportunity that local governments have to lead on climate um, through a grant called the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant. We're going to be able to take, as, as you mentioned, the, um, the Cl Columbus Climate Action Plan and expand it to the Columbus MSA, mm -hmm. which is a 10-county region. And it's incredibly exciting that we're going to be able to do that. Uh, also scary and daunting, um, because when you start to expand our climate action work out to the region, you're really hitting um, both our urban areas, our suburban areas, and our rural areas. And the climate pollution reduction strategies will change based on the area. And we really want our different communities to tell us, what's your priority? Um, we know that the majority of climate pollution comes from building energy use, uh, from transportation, and also from waste. Mm -hmm. um, but in each community, the um, framework may be different based on the energy uses that are happening there. Uh, 
there's a lot of great regions that we can look to. Um, for examples, a lot of great things that are happening in the Northeast, but I always say that I think we can do things better here than almost any other region because we do things the Columbus way, and we've got a really incredible partner in the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission mm -hmm. um, who has uh, great connections throughout the region, um, so I think we're going to do it better than anybody else has done it before. We're a little biased. <laughs> yeah, Columbus people would agree. Um, well, I know Senator uh, DeMora also um, you know, mentioned the example that Franklin County is for the rest of the state. And um, as a Columbus resident, I was pretty excited when the weekly recycling rolled out this year. I think that's a really like tangible way for folks who live here to understand what they can do to make a difference. Um, so I'm wondering how that's going and what sort of investment it was to make that happen here locally. It's a great question, and um, you know, I, with trepidation, I'm going to try to make a sports reference here. But okay. um, <laughs> no score prediction. It's fine. <laughs> no I, score prediction. I won't put you on the me. spot. Um, but you know, what the climate action plan did for the city of Columbus is it really is the offensive line for a lot of the policies that are hard to pass otherwise. To say, hey, this is a policy that we need to pass to be able to meet our climate action goals, and weekly recycling is just like that. Um, we will be able to make incredible progress toward meeting our uh, waste reduction goals um, and our diversion goals uh, by moving to weekly recycling. We anticipate just by doing weekly recycling, in and of itself, you'll have a 25% increase um, in waste diversion. And, and that's huge uh, for the community. Um, and the Climate Action Plan, I, I really believe, is what activated um, a lot of the excitement um, to get us to a weekly uh, recycling program. And I think our residents are very happy um, that we're able to offer that service. Yeah. I was curious if there were um, you know, any challenges associated with making that happen, whether it's um, you know, educating folks about what goes in the bins or being able to scale up to have double the service mm -hmm. offered. Yeah, that's a, that is a great question. Anytime you are making uh, these big changes, there's that scale up and there's increased uh, uh, cost associated with that scale up and, and, and change. Um, and so we have been lucky because we were doing biweekly recycling for so long, we had a lot of lessons learned and we're really able to understand how the collection itself would go. Um, so it's been a knock on wood, a, a pretty smooth transition from bi-weekly to weekly recycling. I think the thing that we're now turning to, which was a little bit of a topic of conversation um, in the last panel, is talking to residents about education. Because recycling right is a huge piece of the puzzle. You can have the infrastructure there to do the recycling, um, but you need to know what uh, you should be putting in the bin. Yeah, and that makes sense. Um, I think we, we put a quiz in the newsletter once, quizzing folks on an item, if it can go in the bin or not, and uh, it was a lot more challenging than I expected. I learned a lot from your website. Yeah, we have a great website. Our Waste Wizard is really helpful in um, helping folks know, because it is ever-changing, and I think you know, that's another thing that is very exciting for us, is more items are becoming recyclable, which means more waste is being able to be diverted from the landfill, um, which is really great. Um, one, another very exciting um, change that's coming to our community is, uh, you know, Rumpke is um, adding a new uh, MRF um, in our community. Um, and that MRF is more than just uh, a municipal recycling facility. It's also going to be a place for workforce development and a place um, where the community can gather. And, you know, one of the things that I think is so challenging about waste is uh, people are so used to bringing your bin out to the end of the driveway every day and not really thinking about what happens um, to that waste next. And so uh, facilities like the MRF really help change people's understanding of what happens after <coughs> things go to the end of your driveway. And we'll be talking with the head of Swaco here in a sec and uh, kind of bringing it full circle so we can better understand where it does go. Yeah. Um, that's very important. 
Um, one thing you mentioned at the beginning that I wanted to um, touch on again is this idea of environmental justice. And I noticed the Climate Action Plan mentions climate justice and environmental justice um, many times. So can you explain how recycling and plastic waste is a social justice issue? Yeah, thank you for that opportunity. So one of the things that is kind of the driving force behind everything that it's in our Climate Action Plan is environmental justice. And that's because, you know, climate change is real. Uh, we are seeing the impacts in our community right now. We're seeing increased flooding. We're seeing extreme heat events. Uh, we're seeing more severe storms. Um, and so it, you might think, well, how does waste relate to any of those things? Um, and how does it relate to environmental justice? Well, the folks that are in our opportunity neighborhoods, our communities of color, they are disproportionately impacted by the impacts of climate change. They are also disproportionately impacted by the effects of, um, of, of uh, litter and pollution in our communities. So annually, the city of Columbus does a litter index. Mm -hmm. It is online. It's a GIS resource. I'd encourage anyone to go to look at it because it is incredibly illuminating. What you will see is that in our opportunity neighborhoods, so our neighborhoods that are um, uh, historically in disinvested neighborhoods, um, oftentimes majority BIPOC community, we see much more litter in our opportunity neighborhoods, and um, we see much more um, plastic pollution in our opportunity neighborhoods. And you know, we're still trying to understand what the long-term effects of that will be, but we know one of those things are that those um, that plastic pollution, you know, it grinds down, it becomes a part of soils um, in the community, and that can have a harmful um, environmental impact uh, for people's health um, and, and well-being. Okay. And what, uh, obviously the index shows you what the problem is, yeah. what, what can be done at this time? Like, is there anything on your radar to address some of those issues? Yeah. So we're still trying to, you know, you're exactly right. The index tells you what, but it doesn't necessarily tell you why. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really the next step is figuring out the why, and, and that's where education is, has come into play. And um, we're spending a lot of time. Um, the mayor has made historic investments in recycling education. We've got a really cute um, campaign right now that's called Fill Her Up. Um, he's a little uh, recycling tote. Um, and, um, and, and it's really about, you know, once we've now brought the infrastructure to our communities, encouraging people to utilize that infrastructure. Okay. Um, and as we discussed with the senator, um, you know, there's different levels of government. Obviously, what you folks are doing is here at the local Columbus level or soon to be in the Columbus region. Um, I'm wondering if there are changes at the state or the federal level that would help you make better progress or cause you know, a more widespread environmental impact. Yeah. Well, if the Climate Action Plan can kind of be the offensive line for other local action, federal action can really be an even greater offensive line for state and local action. There are a few things that are happening at the federal level right now that give us great glimmers of hope. There's a national uh, recycling strategy, which really helps um, to guide the, the path that recycling is moving down. And, and there's a draft um, uh, pollution or prevention, uh, a draft strategy for, uh, there's too many P's in this. There's a draft strategy to prevent plastic pollution. Um, that is at the national level, and we really believe that's going to help the city because it ena would enable us to understand consistently how are we as a nation looking at preventing plastic pollution. Okay. Well, we've got just a couple minutes left, so I'm wondering if there is uh, anything that we should be you know, keeping an eye on for the future. With Axios, we like to say, what's next or what we're watching? So um, what should we keep an eye on? Yeah, so the, the evolution of that strategy is really critical. Um, the federal government just closed comments in July um, on the, that strategy, and we're hopeful to see how it comes to fruition. And then as you mentioned, the, we're really excited for what the Climate Pollution Reduction Grant will do for us in thinking kind of regionally about um, waste. Uh, waste is generally, as you'll hear um, from Joe in um, this next segment,
environment. It is a regional issue, and so um, being able to align um, our climate our climate action plan regionally with the regional waste schools, I think, is gonna gonna be big. Wonderful. Um, well, I wish we had more time, but I think we're gonna leave it there and start with our next speaker. So thank you so much for joining us. And now for our next guest and the final segment of today, um, please join me in welcoming the Executive Director of the Solid Waste Authority of Central Ohio, which we call Swaco around here, Joe Lombardi. So I'm the encore, huh? Yeah, right. say the best for last. <laughs> um, well, as Elena had said, we all produce trash, but many of us may not think about what happens after we wheel it to the curb, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So I thought we could start by having you explain what Swaco is and what its role is in that process after we generate waste. Sure. So Swaco is one of 52 solid waste districts in Ohio. It's created through House Bill 592 in the 80s. Really, the House bill was designed to um, reduce the reliance on landfills and to increase recycling programs throughout the state of Ohio. So we serve 41 communities, uh, all of Franklin County. Uh, we bring in about 1.2 million uh, tons of waste each year just to the landfills. We have two transfer stations and uh, a really robust recycling program, which uh, we'll talk about later today. Yeah. Uh, well, a huge storyline here in Central Ohio is how much we're growing, especially with announcements like Intel. Uh, I know it's very exciting for these sort of developments, but I'm wondering, you know, what's going through your mind when you hear about more people coming in? Because I'm assuming that's going to affect the landfill, and you need to do some things to prepare. Yes. Uh, so, so yeah, it's just like everyone else. Uh, we, we keep up with the reports on how many. Uh, people are going to be coming to the Central Ohio region. Uh, what we're doing right now, strategically looking at um, what we would call land acquisition for strategic moves. Okay. Um, we, we have about 30 years of life left on our um, landfill. It's out about 2062, but if we continue to do what we're doing today, that 2062 is going to shrink, and with all that population growth that's coming, uh, we need to have more education, more recycling programs, make more people aware of what they need to do to keep that material out of our landfill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know Elena was mentioning the diversion rates and how important that is. Instead of just throwing everything in the trash bin and, and not thinking about it, you know, every step somebody takes can get some of that out of the landfill. Um, Obviously, you don't want to talk about it right now, but what, what happens when the landfill fills up? Well, uh, it, you, you have to basically shut it down. Mm -hmm. And uh, to site a new landfill is not the easiest thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, so our goal is to ensure the life of that landfill so that Central Ohio has somewhere for the waste to go in the mm -hmm. future. Um, as you know, we had a landfill that we did um, have to close out on the Jackson Pike. Um, but we're responsible, even when we close a landfill, to maintain that landfill for the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. So whether it, it's open or closed, we still have to maintain it. So our, our hope and our goal and our mission is to ensure the life of that landfill can last beyond everyone in this room and their children and their children's children. Well, uh, I know in our newsletter earlier this year, we mentioned that um, Columbus diverted 51% of its waste from the landfill through composting and recycling in 2021. Uh, and the New York Times highlighted that as a, a big success story. Um, but we also mentioned that you, know, you want to take it higher, and the goal is 75% by 2032. So uh, how do you hope to achieve that, and what sort of challenges might be lying ahead to yeah, do the, that? The 51% was the easy part. It's yeah. the next 25% that's the difficult part, because 75% of what comes in our landfill can be diverted. 
can be recycled, reused, repurposed, or composted. So we are going to continue to have a progressive education program. We want to get into the schools. We want to, we want to get the children involved in the recycling. They're great advocates. <laughs> uh, they, they, they will tell you if any of you have children that you threw something away that should have been recycled. So they're great advocates to help us get to that goal. So I think it's going to take a, a multitude of work throughout the region, not just Swaco. We're going to have to get every community, every individual, every business involved in, in diverting material away from that landfill to get to that uh, 75%. And what happens if someone is wish cycling and they throw something in the bin that shouldn't be in there? So what will happen normally if that goes to a recycling center, it will just be taken away and then and, and ends up back in the landfill. But we have uh, a Recycle Right um, website on Swaco.org. It will give you all the information that you need to tell you what you can recycle, what's not recyclable, and then we also have lists of where to take those hard to recycle materials to other uh, agencies that will then take those uh, so it doesn't end up in the landfill, things like mattresses uh, that, that really bother us when mattresses come in. <laughs> yeah, I imagine the, the knowing and the education is such a big part of it to make sure everything's running as efficiently yeah. as possible. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I really believe the education part of what we do is great. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to crank that up in 2024. I believe there's a lot more we can do with our schools. And we have a business recycling program now. A lot of what comes in there is from the industrial and commercial side. So we're starting a business recycling champion program. It's a pilot right now with two of our local waste haulers mm -hmm. trying to get businesses to either A, start a program, um, we'll help them with some uh, financial uh, help to get it started, we'll give them signage, we'll teach them what to do and maybe get some competition amongst sections in your business. So uh, that's another big uh, focus that we have to have right now is our businesses. Okay. Um, well, you mentioned that when the recycling materials go to a sorting facility, uh, that's the first step. Where do they go after that? What can be done with them? Yeah, so locally, just in Central Ohio, we have over 400 businesses that rely on recycled material. Um, ADS and Hilliard is, is the largest recycler of plastics in the nation. Uh, there's other companies locally, and they either use it as a feedstock for new recycled material or they're hauling it to other businesses to be recycled. So when it goes to a, a rum key, for example, uh, it will be broken down and then sent to these companies for feedstock for whatever product that they're making. And in ADS's uh, situation, they make uh, storm sewer out of, out of plastic. Hmm. That's really interesting. Uh, and I think that's an example of the impact that recycling can also have on the economy. Yeah. So I'm wondering what, uh, impacts beyond just the environment uh, that recycling and reducing plastic usage can have? Yeah, so recycling beside the environmental uh, benefits also brings in billions of dollars in our economy with companies, um, also jobs. Um, and, and we have to make sure that we continue to feed those companies the material that they need to keep that economy going. When we talk to a lot of the companies who use recycled material to make a product, they're telling us there's not enough. Mm -hmm. The demand is high, the supply is not there. Uh, we had a conversation with one company who goes, you can give me every plastic tub you have mm -hmm. and it will not be enough for what we have to do. So all of us have to do a better job of making sure those plastics are recycled. Well, it has to make all of us feel better. I mean, sometimes you wonder, you know, as I'm throwing this in the bin, is it going to do something? Is yeah. this going somewhere? Yeah. And, and clearly it is, and yeah. even locally at that. Yeah, and, and with the, the investment that Rumpke has made locally with their new MRF, as Elena spoke to earlier, um, they're hoping to take more material that currently they can't take. That's another material that might be recyclable and might be used in, in the economy. So uh, we're looking forward to partnering with them with the education part of that as well. 
And obviously, I want to give a shout out to the city of Columbus for their weekly recycling. It's great. I love it. I'm glad they did it, and it's helping us, and it's helping the, the Central Ohio region. Mm -hmm. Well, we've got a couple minutes left. Sure. I wanted to check and see if there is anything else on the horizon that we should be keeping an eye on here the months or years ahead. Yeah, I, I do believe that, number one, 70% of consumers want their packaging to be recyclable, and they, they do support companies that are sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so we have to keep that in mind as we throw stuff into our trash or whether we throw it into our blue bin. And I think there needs to be more investment in infrastructure. We're going to need to, we're going to, need to have the infrastructure to be able to recycle these materials. And I can't say enough about the education part of it. And that's our job. That's our job to make people aware, make it uniformed, uh, make people that are not there. Maybe they're recycling, mm -hmm. but they could do a better job. So we need to find out where those locations are here in central Ohio and really uh, push a PR campaign in those areas. Yeah, well, stuff like this is probably a first step. Everybody's so. got some homework to I go so. check out the website yes. and see if you're recycling the correct way. That's right, recycleright.com, I think it is, or .org. So it is on the Swaco website. So. Yeah. <laughs> Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time. Okay. So thank you so much for joining us. And before we wrap, I also wanted to just give a final thank you to the American Chemistry Council for making today's event possible. And to all of you, our audience, for joining us in the room and online. Um, and one last plug, please sure, be sure to subscribe to the Axios Columbus newsletter for a daily look at all of the news happening here in central Ohio. Thanks again. <laughs>